They've been our close companions for thousands of years. They've followed in our footsteps as we forged new environments. But their superior senses and great stamina come from their ancestor, the wolf. For thousands of years, we've harnessed their extraordinary senses and abilities. But how did we get from the wolf, a wild predator, to the tame companion that shares our homes? The answer is hidden in our shared history. Europe's historic hunting lodges hold a clue. It's here that the evolution of a unique partnership was played out in its most sophisticated form, that of the hunter and his dog. A relationship that's lasted to the present day. crossbred our dogs and dramatically altered their appearance. So is there any wolf still left in the modern dog? Lake Baikal in Siberia. It's somewhere here in the heart of Asia that wolf became dog over 15,000 years ago. And even today, dogs play an important role for the local hunters. Alexander is carrying on a long family tradition, trapping wild animals. The Russian sable is said to have the most beautiful silky coat. Its fur fetches astronomical prices. But first, the precious skins must be prepared to preserve their sheen. Alexander uses traditional techniques passed down from generation to generation. Alexander's ancestors also had a helper, the Laika, a Russian hunting dog. The Laika were first used as sled dogs, but soon proved to have other valuable skills. Their sensitive noses pick up the faintest scent of the sable. They've found their quarry. For the moment, the sable is safe up in the tree, but not for long. The Laika are trained not to take their eyes off the animal until the hunter arrives. Alexander is sometimes joined by his son Fyodor. Fyodor no longer hunts. He now works as a park ranger, protecting the surrounding forests. Fyodor believes that traditional hunting has no future in the 21st century. The fur trade is now mostly supplied by commercial farming. Alexander may be one of the last in a line of wild sable hunters. Does this mean the end of an ancient alliance between hunter and Laika? Maybe not. Fyodor also has Laikas as companions. It's a relationship that's not so easy to break. Some of the forests around Lake Baikal are still virtually untouched by man. This is an idyllic wilderness, rich in wildlife. But it continues to harbor poachers, hunting with steel traps.
The Leica run the risk of serious injury and have to learn to recognize the danger. This region once supported large populations of sable. Their numbers have declined markedly and Alexander now has to venture deep into the forest to search for them. It's the end of the road. The rest has to be done on foot. The old hunter may be gone for weeks, but he has company. Hunter and dog know this terrain well. Nonetheless, they need all their senses and experience crossing the rushing waters. This faithful Laika lost her forepaw to a sharp river rock. She's not as fast as she used to be, but she's kept her acute sense of smell. With little hesitation, she leads the hunter to the sable's regular haunt. Alexander sets his trap. Throughout history, hunters have used dogs' super-sensitive noses to sniff out prey. It's no different in Siberia today. The trap is baited and set. The lightest touch will trigger it. Opa. It's deadly for the animal, but spares its coat. When the skins are soft enough, they're carefully cleaned. It's hard to imagine that these scraggly looking pelts will fetch vast sums in luxury boutiques around the world. Times are changing, even in these farthest corners of Siberia. An ancient partnership is changing too. For Fyodor, there's no going back to the old ways. But what about the Leica? What is its future? In Fyodor's case, he's taking his dog with him as a companion on his new chosen course. Alexander is one of the last of his kind. Sable was much prized by the Russian nobility, and at one time, 25,000 animals were killed each year. Hunting restrictions and reintroductions saved them from extinction, and sable farms now supply much of the demand. If the hunter disappears from Lake Baikal, so could his lifelong companion, the Laika. It's been like this throughout history. The job disappears, so does a particular breed of dog. Thousands of kilometers away, in central France, the hunting dog has surprisingly withstood the test of time. It's become an accessory of the aristocracy and of the wealthy. In the Middle Ages, hunting became a favorite pastime of European nobility, and nowhere was hunting with hounds as popular as in France. The French tricolor hound was bred to hunt in packs. Living and working in groups of 50 or more, there's no room for disagreements. Their handler trains them ceaselessly, so they obey only him. Here, the trophies are traditionally awarded to the pack.
With hunting a sport for royalty, it's not surprising the quarry is similarly regal. It's the rutting season. The stags are pumped up with testosterone. The morning of the hunt, a small Jack Russell Terrier is sent ahead to pick up the trail. He's not interested in just any deer. He's after the scent of one particular stag. Once he's found the trail he was looking for, the hunt can begin. Dogs and hunters assemble. The hounds are raring to go. But a hunt like this is a large-scale operation, and everything is meticulously planned. These hounds are natural hunters, and once off the leash, there'll be no holding them back. They're strong and athletic, bred for speed and stamina. have picked up the scent, and they're off. The stag has a head start and knows his domain well, but the hounds are close behind and won't lose the trail. The pack now hunt as a team, much like their ancestors. There's still a hint of wolf in this dog. Their quarry is experienced. The stag confuses his followers by crossing his own tracks time and time again. But French hounds are bred to hunt and can follow their prey relentlessly for hours on end. After three hours, the hunt is finally called off. The stag has won the day. Over a period of 15,000 years, we've turned the wolf into the dog we see today. Through generations of patient training and selecting the best, breeding and crossbreeding. We've selected for speed and stamina, for color and body shape. From one animal, the wolf, we've produced hundreds of distinct breeds. Throughout Western Europe, nobles protected vast stretches of land just for hunting. Imposing hunting lodges were a symbol of power and status. And the wealthiest of all developed their own, often exclusive, breed of dog. And these dogs developed new abilities. Depending on the breed, the dogs would either surround the quarry or attack it, for some with fatal consequences. Moritzburg Castle in eastern Germany, one of the most infamous of European hunting lodges. The surrounding lakes and woodlands were a favorite hunting ground of the King of Saxony. 300 years ago, it became the setting for a large-scale massacre. The entrance to the castle provides the first clues as to the victims of the slaughter.
Inside is the biggest collection of red deer antlers in the world. Hunting in water was especially popular here. Huntsmen and dogs drove the quarry into lakes and shot them from boats. The bigger the spectacle, the more successful the entertainment. The hunt now played a central role among the nobility, forming social bonds and political alliances. As a result, it became a highly ritualized affair, like a well-planned military campaign. Every day the sound of bugles echoed through the forest, an overture to the cruelest of concerts. Attracted by generous provisions of food, the deer soon lost their fear. The trap was set. Surrounded by hundreds of beaters and their dogs, there was no escape. It was cut off by lines of flapping cloth the deer were afraid to pass. Then the noose was pulled tight. The hunting dogs were unleashed. Their mission, to drive the deer straight into the path of the waiting guns. This was no longer hunting as a noble pastime, but a blood sport entirely for entertainment. And as hunting evolved, the dog's role changed too. He was now part of the entertainment. In a single day, over 200 deer and up to 400 wild boar would be slaughtered in a spectacle as cruel as the Roman games. And among the casualties were also many dogs. The ancient partnership between man and his best friend had taken a sinister turn. Throughout history, the evolution of hunting and of hunting dogs went hand in hand. Hunters selected dogs with sensitive noses and three very different behaviours. Pointing, flushing and retrieving. As they bred and crossbred the dogs, they dramatically altered their appearance, creating an eclectic mix. But they all have one thing in common speed and stamina. Just like their ancestor, the wolf. Since the dawn of time, wolves were our rivals, hunting for much the same food. They impressed us with their complex societies. Their agility and endurance were superior to ours. But 130,000 years ago, some wolves were attracted to human encampments and the easy pickings of food around them. As the wolves moved closer to human settlements, the process of domestication began. But the more dogs became man's best friend, the more the wolf would become the incarnation of evil. As our human population reached deeper into the wolves' terrain, the animal we'd once welcomed into our homes now filled us with fear. In the 18th century, a fearsome wolf was said to haunt a village in the Givaudan region of southern France. 20,000 people gathered to rid the area of the terrible beast. It was believed to have killed scores of people, mostly women and children. 
The saga of a shockingly brutal monster quickly took on mythical proportions. Mothers were terrified to let their children out of their sight. After living peacefully side by side for thousands of years, the wolf was suddenly a competitor to man, stealing his livestock and could be blamed for anything. Stories like Little Red Riding Hood, written in France at the time, helped seal the wolf's reputation once and for all. The villagers succeeded in hunting down a wolf. For a moment, there was relief. But then the killing started again. The king sent his royal hunters to the region. They too brought down a wolf. But soon after, further victims were discovered. The villagers started to believe they were cursed. Two years later, a hybrid, half dog, half wolf, was shot. At last, the village was freed from its curse. We may never know if the beast of Gévaudin was merely a legend. But recent archaeological discoveries have thrown new light on our shared history with the dog. Excavations in Cologne in Germany reveal evidence for man's relationship with dogs dating back some 2,000 years. It seems man and dog lived side by side throughout the city's history. But what role did the animal play in our lives? A closer look at the remains reveals a darker secret. The artifacts uncovered here, from ceramic dishes and toys to animal bones and tools, give an insight into the cultural life of one of Europe's oldest cities. They also shed light on our early relationship with the dog. Many of the skulls and bones of Roman dogs show signs of injury and physical violence, probably caused by kicking and throwing stones. It seems we didn't always treat the dog as man's best friend. Broken or scarred ribs suggest a similar story. And in the Middle Ages, it was no better. This skull was split by an axe while the animal was still alive. Other cuts on the bones were inflicted after the dog had died, almost certainly caused by skinning the animal for its fur. Clothes and blankets made out of dog skin were popular in the Middle Ages. But how would it be if we could start all over again? Scientists in Siberia are carrying out an unusual experiment. They're attempting to copy and speed up the process of domestication. This time, not with wolves, but with foxes. The aim of the experiment is to turn wariness and aggression into friendliness and affection. These young foxes are happy to see their human carers, and they greet them affectionately, much like young puppies. They enjoy the physical contact and like being stroked. Domestication involves breeding and selection. Only the tamest animals are allowed to mate, generation after generation. In time, the foxes change genetically, and the same genes that determine behavior may also be linked to physical traits. 
So domestication can result in new body designs like floppy ears, short legs or rounder snouts. The scientists have found that the skulls of the domesticated foxes have become shorter and broader, just as in the dog. An overbite or protruding front teeth are another sign of domestication. Blood samples are taken to measure adrenaline levels. These are found to decrease with each generation as the animals become tamer. The researchers are also looking for the genes that determine aggression and tameness in an animal. Since the genome of the dog was decoded in 2005, we've discovered that just a handful of genes determine all the variations we see today. Will this be true for domesticated foxes one day? But it's not just genes that influence domestication. It also requires constant close contact with man. It's only by learning to overcome their natural hunting and killing instincts that foxes will one day lose their aggression. In this fox nursery, the youngsters play with their foster carers, much like young puppies. Presumably, it was interactions like these that helped turn the aggressive wolf into the tame dog. When wolves were first attracted to human settlements searching for food, some may have been braver and more approachable than others. But they were still wild animals, it took tens of thousands of years to evolve into the domestic dog that lives peacefully alongside us and shares our homes. In this experiment, the researchers want to achieve the same evolutionary changes in a fraction of the time. But not every fox has bought into the idea. The wolf is a predator and, given the chance, would have little hesitation in killing sheep or cattle. And yet, the sheepdog has no such intent. Indeed, for thousands of years, it's been the shepherd's indispensable helper. This old German shepherd dog, the Harzerfuchs, is known to be hardworking, intelligent and obedient. It quickly learns what's wanted. It's the perfect herding dog. It still resembles the wolf more than any other breed of dog, but its strength and speed are now used to protect our livestock. Many sheepdogs are out of work today. With changing agricultural practices and fewer natural predators, their skills are no longer required. Could this signal the end of the sheepdog? In some cases, their skills are now being used for other purposes. The German Shepherd is popular with the armed forces, the police and search and rescue teams, which value its strength and reliability. But there may be another lifeline for the sheepdog. Wild wolves are making a comeback in Europe. And as they do, there may be a need for sheepdogs again. So the wolf may end up saving its domestic cousin. Today there are over 340 recognized breeds of dogs. 
For a long time, we selected qualities that made them useful for hunting. But from the 19th century, dogs were also selected for their looks. Now they were not just working animals, but elegant pets and good companions. One dog breed admired both for its elegant appearance and as a hunter was the Weimarana. It was created exclusively for royalty who wanted a noble-looking and reliable gun dog. Highly prized, the Weimarana often lived with the family, guarding the home and playing with the children. It soon became a loving and loyal family pet. It was named after the court of Weimar in Germany. The unusual amber-colored eyes and the charcoal gray coat give this breed a regal appearance. But these large, athletic dogs were first and foremost designed to hunt. They have highly sensitive noses and a strong desire to sniff out prey. It's easy to see why they were prized for their speed and stamina. The Weimarana shows what a hundred thousand years of domestication has achieved turning a wild predator into an obedient and loyal companion. And the early life of a dog gives us a further clue as to how this transformation took place. The puppies are born blind and deaf and can only sense the world around them with their nose. This is the start of the imprinting period. They learn what their mother and siblings smell and feel like and communicate with little grunts and mews. The closeness of the family provides comfort and security. One month later, their eyes and ears have opened. The puppies begin to explore the world around them and play with their litter mates, learning their first social skills. six weeks old, it's time for the first family excursion. Their world is becoming bigger by the day. There's always something new to discover. The armed forces. As their taste buds develop, the pups are weaned off their mother's milk and take a greater interest in solid foods. At eight weeks old, the most important period of their development begins. The bond between dog and man is formed. These early experiences will seal their future relationship with humans. And that has a lot to do with vision. This imprinting process was crucial for the domestication of the dog. The strength of these bonds is now being tested in the laboratory. This border collie has learned to understand human hand signals. Even our close relatives, the great apes, struggle with this kind of experiment. The dog has acquired this skill through years of domestication. The next task is more complex. The dog is told not to touch the sausage. But then the instructor turns around. With no eye contact between human and dog, what will the collie do?
the dog is clever. It knows it's not being watched. In fact, this is more than just intelligence. The dog's close bond with humans allows it to empathize and understand exactly what we want. It has a strong desire to please us and so copies our movements. The Border Collie copies the instructor's every move with perfect precision. This copying behavior is known to reinforce the bond between two partners. Another demonstration of evolution through our shared history. It's a big day for the young puppies. Time for them to leave their mother and siblings. At eight weeks old, they're the perfect age to form a strong bond with their new human family. Just as these children have selected their favorite puppy from the litter, humans have selected dogs for their hunting abilities and companionship for generations. There's immediate empathy between human and dog. It's an emotional bond that will grow even stronger with time. From now on, humans will be their best friends. Thousands of years of domestication may have dramatically altered the appearance and behavior of the dog, but some of its wolf-like qualities remain. They can hear about four times the distance of humans, and their big and movable ears allow them to locate the sound more precisely. They also hear higher pitched noises than we do, extending well into the ultrasonic range. But the most developed sense is without doubt the dog's super sensitive nose. Throughout history, we valued its ability to sniff out prey. So not surprisingly, we've selected for ever better noses. Some dogs have up to 300 million scent detectors, making them world-class sniffers and a million times better at smelling than humans. A dog's eyes may be one of its most endearing features, but they're far less specialized than its other senses. They've mostly evolved to detect movement, useful for hunting. The same object, when stationary, will easily be overlooked. Dogs also see in color, with one exception. They can't detect red, and the position of their eyes dictates a wide but two-dimensional image. Yet an experiment to test what a dog sees when it looks at a human reveals some surprising results. The computer tracks the dog's eye movements. The dog is presented with faces showing different expressions. First, a sad face. The dog sees it and lowers his tail dolefully. He has reacted to the emotional state of the human in front of him. The green dots indicate which part of the face the dog is looking at. It's always the eyes. The dog reads a person's expression to deduce their emotional state. It's an extraordinary feat since dogs use very different body language to express emotions. Another image. 
this time of an angry man. The dog watches the face intently. An infrared camera measures its state of arousal when faced with different expressions. Understanding how dogs process emotional information may help us deploy their skills in innovative ways. From hunting buddy to family pet, and now a new kind of helper. These days, a dog's lifestyle is an urban one, just like ours. And there are new roles for dogs in this modern world. These young retrievers are being trained for new careers. They're learning to stay calm in the busiest and noisiest shopping center. To fulfill their role as man's companion and protector in the 21st century, they have to be focused and reliable at home in this urban jungle. The noise, the lights, the smells of the city, it's an alien environment for an animal. Once they've mastered these challenges, they're ready to take on their new job. This young dog is learning to recognize the signs of low blood sugar in a patient with diabetes. The distinctive smell is coupled with the reward so that the dog knows it's important. Aini is a dog that has already successfully completed this training. He's Sophie's constant companion. Sophie has diabetes. She's too young to realize when her blood sugar levels drop dangerously low. Aini is there to protect her. He knows just what to do. His sensitive nose has picked up the telltale signs. It's time for a boost of insulin. But Aini's job isn't done when Sophie goes to bed. He's on night shift. Everyone relies on him to wake the family should the little girl need help. It's a big responsibility, but Aini has been trained to keep watch. Little wonder that the dog is called man's best friend. The role of the dog in the modern world is changing. Once hunters, they're now turning into helpers. The more we learn about their skills and abilities, the more we can enlist their aid. In this laboratory, dogs are being trained for a new working role, sniffing out cancer. Some of the tubes contain the smell of healthy people, Others, those of cancer patients with tumors in their lungs or throat. The dogs have been taught the scent of cancer. They're now being tested for their reliability. His job is to indicate which samples contain the smell of the illness the hunting instinct is still at play. Astonishingly, the success rate is over 90%. But not everyone is ready to let go of the dog as a traditional hunting companion. 
The fox hunt was a popular sport in the British countryside for hundreds of years. Since 2005, it's been banned. <laughs> Nevertheless, some dogs are still hunting today. But they're not after live animals. Dummy training is the latest fashion. The dogs now have to retrieve a decoy rather than a fox or a rabbit. A centuries-old tradition continues in a different guise. And each dog must learn to wait its turn. Britain is also home to one of the best known hunting dogs, the Bloodhound. Once they pick up a scent, they rarely lose it. No other breed has such a sensitive nose. With the ban on fox hunting, the future of the Bloodhound is suddenly uncertain. But innovative dog owners have come up with a solution, hunting without killing. It's an idea that's already successfully used with other breeds. Labradors and Retrievers were among the most popular hunting dogs in the 19th century, retrieving game for hunters. Their gentle nature and endearing passion for collecting almost anything makes them a popular family dog today. But maybe the bravest hunting dog is the smallest. The Dachshund seems to have little fear of wild boar several times its size. While the Dachshund is happy chasing anything that moves, the Bloodhounds are facing a bigger challenge. They're on the trail of a new kind of prey, human joggers. It's the hunter's way of continuing their favorite sport. The runners get an hour's head start. Then everyone is on the move. From hunting buddy to sporting companion, dog and man are still best friends. It's taken centuries for us to breed the perfect hunting companion. So maybe it's not surprising that the urge to hunt is still very much in the blood of most of our dogs.